Good evening, everybody from uh, Doha. We have around 800 people signed from uh, all over the world attending uh, this evening. This is an initiative from the editor of the Sports Medicine Collection, Professor Nebosha Popovic, supported by Aspetar and supported by Aspire Zone Foundation. We have a, an exciting lineup this evening. We will we'll be talking about uh, training methods and assessment, which is the chapter that you have received uh, when you signed up. And we have uh, um, different experts that will cover uh, various aspects of uh, testing and uh, assessment and how to use the information to train athletes. Um, we have uh, Professor JB Moren from uh, Saint Etienne in France. Uh, we have Dr. Phil Graham Smith from uh, Aspire Academy in Qatar. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Scott Cocking from Aspire in Qatar and uh, Mr. Andrew Fornesiero from uh, Aspire Academy in Qatar. And I will talk about uh, also handball um, during this session. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this evening. is Professor uh, Jean-Benoit Morin from the University of Saint-Étienne. He is a widely published author on the topic of uh, sprint running mechanics, uh, has done a lot of work also with athletes in this particular field. Uh, his article is in the chapter that you downloaded and uh, this evening he will be talking about sprint running mechanics and how to assess it. Thank you very much, Marco, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, Aspetar for inviting me to, to contribute to, these, uh, to this series and to this online event. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself uh, quickly. I'm uh, Professor Maureen. I work at the University of Saint-Étienne in a laboratory called LIBM. And uh, I'm also an associate researcher at Sports Research Institute New Zealand. Uh, and I work mainly on performance and locomotion biomechanics. So thank you, and uh, I'm going to share my screen. So we are going to talk about sprint running mechanics, and um, I'm going to focus, like the chapter uh, of, of the book uh, points, to uh, on force assessment in sprinting. So basically, if you want to follow our works on the topic, and if you want to follow our new works on the topic, you can log uh, to my website or to my Twitter account. And um, I'm going to go through past, present, and future, uh, mixing laboratory and field approaches of assessing force output in sprinting. Because you know that assessing force output in sprinters can have many, many, many applications in terms of knowledge, in terms of performance, but also in terms of prevention. However, how we pointed out um, in, in, a, in a review in 2016 is that Assessing the force output of a sprinter, a football player, a rugby player, when people run at 10 to 12 meters a second is a challenge. It's almost mission impossible because the body is moving super fast and it's very difficult to assess the force output of the muscles. And so we have to assess some external forces. In the last years, and there has been some very good works on modeling and uh, simulation to estimate the joint and the muscle forces and to also estimate the ground force outputs that is based on uh, video analysis, uh, forces, ground forces measurements and modeling, of course. And of course, you can have some insights into the force outputs, but it is not directly experimentally quantified. It is approached by simulation. And like any other modeling, this comes with postulates, assumptions, and simplifications. And most of the studies focus on steady state running, whereas most sports performance include accelerated run, which is a totally different context. So another type of force output that will be maybe the future it's been published in nature uh, three years ago now is that maybe one day we will be able to assess force output the force tension just out of the muscle in the tendon by using this vibration technique so these authors showed that if you use vibration to the tendon and you record the wave speed of the vibration then you have an indirect um, uh, indicator of the muscle tendon tension, which is an indicator of the muscle output. So maybe one day, as you can see in this uh, very promising picture, 
we will have players, athletes, directly equipped with these uh, devices, and we can assess, like here, for example, at the hamstring, the force output during realistic locomotion. But for now, we have to go back to some more indirect measurements. So very early in the research uh, um, uh, publications, running speed has been modeled as step length multiplied by step frequency, which is correct, mechanically speaking. But as was discussed by Aki Salo, a researcher uh, specialized into sprinting, these are descriptors of sprint performance, but they are not the causes of performance because as per Newton's laws of dynamics, the causes of our movements are the forces we generate and the ground reaction force that we apply. And I like this sentence by Einstein that said, not everything that we count can be counted and vice versa. It means that in the past, it's, we were able to assess step length and step frequency, but maybe it was not the first um, causes of motion that, that, that should have been studied uh, at, at first time. So the model we suggest is to assess ground reaction force and impulse because that is what is driving the body forward. And of course, sprinting means producing force and transmitting that force to the ground with effectiveness in very different contexts, from acceleration to top speed, from low velocity to high velocity, with uncertainty, fatigue, and, and variable positions in team sports, for example. And so the entire assessment is based on ground reaction force, that's the main causes of motion, and we can also assess the kinematics, which is the movement of the segments, to describe the sprint pattern or the sprint form. So if you want a practical summary of, of our model, we could say that sprint performance means generating force, producing force, that's the motor, and also transmitting force uh, onto the, the ground so that the ground will have a, a ground reaction force that will drive us. And so the first studies that uh, addressed that issue were made uh, by French biomechanists, uh, Etienne Jules Marais, in, uh, as you can see, the end of the 19th century. And at that time, he was measuring pressure rather than force on the ground, and he was just using air systems, paper and ink, which is almost poetic in a way. And um, the, main, the first main study that came after that was published in 1971 by Italian researcher Professor uh, Cavagna. And it was the first time that some force plates were used within the ground to study the force output of a sprinter, okay? So it was very early in the biomechanics um, uh, story, let's say. And so here, Cavagna says, the force output on the system, on the center of mass of the system, will be equal to mass multiplied by acceleration plus the friction forces. And for the first time, you can see the direct application of Newton's laws to the sprinter's motion that link force output to acceleration. Another attempt was made uh, in France in 2015, and, and I was uh, very lucky to collaborate with my uh, colleagues at the INSEP on that. We basically did exactly the same as Cavagna did, as you can see here. These are force plates mounted into the track, okay? And we can get some repeated sprints because it's only seven meters of, of measurement. So we have to, to ask sprinters to do multiple trials. And because elite sprinters are very reproducible, we can collect the data, and then add the data to form an entire sprint. So for the first time, we were able to study a virtual 40-meter sprint. And a bit later in time, two years after this publication, was published in Japan by Ryu Nagahara in 2017, the first paper using that fantastic track that's in, in Japan, which is a 50-meter force plate system that can uh, measure all the ground reaction forces. You can see all the steps of a sprint, so you can really go deep into the mechanics of sprinting within one single sprint. And in my opinion, this kind of uh, revolutionized the study of sprinting mechanics because it is realistic sprinting, it's not treadmill, and you have direct access to the data because uh, these colleagues have a, a very high uh, data processing power. So this is very cool. But it's unique. There's only one place in the world where you can do this kind of, of studies. So in running mechanics, when you cannot assess the runner on the ground, 
it's very practical to ask people to run uh, in place on the treadmill. And so the first instrumented treadmill studies were published in uh, the end of the 80s by uh, Henri Lacomi in uh, the UK. And here is the system. You sprint on the treadmill, you're attached by the waist, and you increase the speed of the treadmill so we can record the running speed and we can record the force output that your body is driving forward and the force sensor is placed at this level. But the main limitation, of course, is that the force output is not measured at the foot. So it's not measured at the interaction with the ground. And as you can see here, the speed is not very high and the speed, the, the shape of the speed curve is not really corresponding to the field. But that was, you know, a pioneer work. And of course, it's been improved in the years after. The first improvement was made in my laboratory in Saint-Étienne. So we have a long history of treadmill, uh, instrumented treadmill here. My colleagues, uh, this was almost my master's degree, I think, the, the moment of my master's degree here. So my colleagues added a motor to, um, let's say, uh, compensate for the inertia of the treadmill and added also an, an angle measurement here to know the exact forward force output. So the good improvement here is that the speed increase is very close to what happens on the field. This was young handball players in that paper. And the limitation, of course, is that the force is still not measured at the foot. So we have some force signal that is not realistic if you compare that to uh, ground reaction forces, of course. And this is just for fun. Myself, 20 years ago, when I was a, a young and fast, let's say, <laughs> master student on that treadmill. So the main improvement uh, came from the United States with uh, Peter Weyand and collaborators. And as you can see here, this paper in 2000 presents a very fast sprint treadmill. And the subjects basically drop on the treadmill um, as, they, as they sprint. And the treadmill records the vertical forces. So the good point with this treadmill is that you can measure kinetics and kinematics. You can go to very high speeds. Believe me, this is an Olympic athlete and is super fast here. But the treadmill doesn't allow you to quantify acceleration. And of course, this type of sprint never happens in real life because nobody runs at top speed without an acceleration before. So the improvement that we, that we made to that uh, overall uh, technology was made in 2010 and published in the Journal of Biomechanics. And we published um, an instrumented treadmill that, let's say, covered most of the issues. And um, uh, I just tested the treadmill this morning. It was fun. Uh, and so you can see that the treadmill is driven by the force output on the ground of the athlete. So it means the more the athlete pushes backward, the more the treadmill accelerates and vice versa. And you can go up to very fast speed and of course, the treadmill is able to record three-dimension ground reaction forces over the entire acceleration. So that was the main, let's say, uh, improvement, the main breakthrough. It was that we can cover all the steps of a real, let's say, on the treadmill acceleration. The other good point is that you can synchronize some devices with these uh, force measurements. And as you can see here, you can synchronize EMG for muscles activity assessment or uh, kinematics, so you can assess both force output and kinematics, which is a project we have right now. So in summary, if you want to assess the ground reaction force output to understand performance, to work on prevention, whatever, you have two options, and it's almost two impossibilities because it's very unique. Find an instrumented treadmill. There's only two in the world, one in Saint-Étienne and one uh, in Doha, and or find some force plates. And as you know, treadmills is um, not the perfect approach. Force plates almost exist nowhere. And this is very frustrating. So with my uh, PhD student, we decided to tackle the question, can we assess force output at the center of mass one way or another using field devices? So this method was published in 2016. It's a macroscopic approach. It means we assess the force output at the level of the center of mass. And everything in that method is based on this beautiful fact 
that has been also identified in the in the 20s by uh, Archibald Hill. It's that when humans accelerate, the velocity of running increases in an exponential way. And this exponential describes very well uh, elite sprinters, as you can see here, the French sprinter, uh, European champion in 2010. It describes uh, team sport players. You can see here two football players. The world record by Usain Bolt also follows that exponential increase in speed. Uh, young people, this is my son when he was three, accelerating. Older people, this is a 96-year-old sprinter that we were um, uh, uh, very lucky to measure. And so from that equation, we were able just using very simple Newton laws of dynamics to estimate the force output as a function of time, displacement, speed, and acceleration. As you have seen in Cavania's study, this is pretty uh, direct application of, of the basic laws of motion. So this method is absolutely not new, and the first to observe that this exponential increase in speed was uh, describing human acceleration was Archibald Hill, in a paper of 27, 28. And uh, I love these pictures because you can see that the, the, the real laboratory at the very beginning of human physiology was the field. And this is something we need to keep in mind. This is Nobel Prize uh, laureate Archibald Hill doing some measurements on field sprinting, not in the lab. Well, actually the lab was the field and vice versa. So we just use that equation and this was also observed several times in the history. So this is a 79 paper by uh, Russian colleagues using a wire that was attached to the runner. And they also observed this exponential increase in speed. So this is a model that's really solid to describe human locomotion. So the validation of these equations was made against force plate gold standard. And so the first time it was using multiple sprints with the INSEPT data because of only seven meters force plate. And the second time, we validated that method again. It was published uh, two years ago using the fantastic track of uh, Ryu Nagahara in Japan. So very briefly, you can read that paper if you want to see the details, but comparing the equations to the force plate measurement, we obtained pretty good results. As you can see here, a typical sprint. This is the squares are every step of the force, the component of the force that horizontally directed. The, uh, the diamonds here are the vertical component of the force output and the, the power associated to the force output in the horizontal direction of motion compared to the line, which is our equations. And you see that's, that's almost a perfect fit. So the main statistics show that we only need simple inputs to use that method, body mass, position, and running velocity or time, but they need to be measured accurately. So if you have a poor reliability in these inputs, then of course the model will not be reliable. That makes sense. It is pretty reliable and it has a good cost accuracy feasibility ratio. Of course, it's not gold standard, but it's very uh, it's accurate enough to do some good field measurements. And in practice, you only need one acceleration to quantify everything. So it's very fun to see that some colleagues um, added some uh, devices in the toolbox. For example, Pedro Jimenez uh, created that app, My Sprint, that is used in iPhones or iPads, and that uses the high frame rate of these devices uh, and does exactly what Etienne Jules Marais did more than a century ago, filming the motion to identify the time speed events and calculate everything. You can also do that with wire systems, and we published a spreadsheet to help you uh, calculate everything with only very simple inputs. And what I like in science is that some people push the development forward and among the many practical applications of that method was published last year by Laurie Stenroth, an application to ice hockey acceleration that shows that this model is also useful and valid in ice hockey. And what I like also is that these authors proposed another way to assess the acceleration using a camera that's a GoPro, so it's not an iPhone anymore, using some markers, and they generated their own spreadsheet. It's free and it's available on ResearchGate so that you can set your own setting and calculate everything. So just for fun and, and to conclude my talk, this is something that we did based on Usain Bolt's speed data. We were not in Berlin during the world record, and we just got the data of speed 
and knowing the body mass estimation of the athlete, you can calculate the force output. And what you need to keep in mind is that if Berlin track was instrumented with force plates, we would have found some data that are really close to the data that we that we have generated here. So it's a very direct and simple way to estimate things with a good level of uh, estimation accuracy. So please keep in mind that yes, all the models are wrong and have some limitations, including this one, but some models are useful. And so the main limitations are within the method, but it's also within the subjects, the protocol and the analysis. Most of the data that we see that don't seem to be reliable are because of a low reliability of the subjects themselves or the measurements devices, because then the equations are all the same. So the inputs play a major role in the accuracy of the outputs. And this is where we are in the, in the fantastic story of, of uh, force assessment in sprinting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morin, for joining us uh, from France this evening and to provide a very comprehensive uh, overview of um, how to assess uh, sprint running mechanics, but also for uh, providing something really, really simple that can be used uh, in the field uh, every day. As we've seen in the talk, uh, uh, it's, it's a really good example of how science can be really complicated, but it becomes very simple in the application. So there has been a lot of years of study going from uh, instrumented treadmills uh, to uh, uh, simple field-based assessments. And now we have a solution that is uh, relatively cheap. It can be used anywhere in the world and they can be used to track athletes. So I strongly uh, suggest you to uh, read more uh, about the work of uh, Professor J.B. Morin, but also to use the spreadsheet that is made uh, publicly available. And, and actually, we, we now move on to uh, uh, another topic, again, of assessment. Um, and it, it, it follows very nicely from assessing sprints, which is a, a common way uh, in many sports. Uh, we will now talk about assessing jumps. Uh, and there is a connection, of course, with jumps in Qatar because the current world champion is uh, in high jump is uh, Mutaz Barshim that uh, won the gold medal here in Qatar in Doha 2019. So the speaker now is uh, Dr. Phil Graham-Smith. Uh, he will talk about jump testing to assess athletes. He is the head of biomechanics and innovation at Aspire Academy. And before joining Aspire, he's worked for many years with uh, jumpers of all sorts uh, in the UK. He's published a lot on this topic, but also he developed technology to make it easy for people to assess jumps. So we will hear a lot about uh, how to make jump assessments and how to apply the information for uh, applications in training. Thank you, Marco. And uh, thank you, Aspita, for giving me the opportunity to come and talk tonight on something that I've been doing for almost 30 years now. I know I look quite young, but there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of years behind this face. Um, yes, jumping. Uh, as Marco said, I've, I've been working with jumpers, the, the British long and triple jump squads, high jumpers, uh, since 1992, before coming to Qatar almost eight years ago. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you tonight is a, a bit of a, an overview of the application of jump assessment. It's more born out of experience than a, a historical uh, approach and, and looking to, to pass research. Uh, hopefully there'll be some take-home messages for you, particularly around force plate assessments, um, which have become quite uh, um, frequent in the, the literature these days. So why do we test jumpers' ability? As, as I said, it's nothing new. We, we've been testing jumps. Uh, Bosco's work back in the 80s did a lot of work on jump testing. And I dare say, jump testing was happening long, long, long before that. Um, one of the reasons why I'm not going to quote too many research papers is that a lot of this boils down to Newton's laws and conservation of energy, as J.B. Morin just said in his, in his talk. But ultimately, what we're trying to do, we're trying to measure an athlete's ability to accelerate their body by a, applying force rapidly against the ground in a very controlled, easy to measure and reliable test. And the different applications of jump testing are the following. Identifying talent, profiling athletes' physical or physiological attributes, 
tracking changes before and after uh, training phases, detecting asymmetries in muscle output from a return to play scenario, and detecting how athletes are responding to training loads in fatigue monitoring, which has become quite an, uh, an in vogue uh, new type of assessment of jumps in, in currently. So common jump types. This is a, a squat jump. You see this start in a, a squat position and it's essentially a measure of concentric muscle output. Another one is a counter movement where you start in an upright position, you bend down, initiating a low velocity stretch shortening cycle which is essentially eccentric followed by concentric. Then we move on to a more demanding jump which is a drop jump. It's an impact response stretch shortening cycle with an eccentric concentric phase. But we mustn't forget that there are other types of jumps in a horizontal direction like the standing long jump uh, and again, like the, the counter movement, it's a self-initiated stretch shortening cycle with no impact, this time for distance. So there's many options for assessing jumping ability. They range from very cheap to very expensive, and it all depends on the amount of information and the depth of information you want. So chalk and wall, very simple, costs about a pound. A Vertec, a little bit more expensive because you've got some equipment there, ranging probably from a pound to about a hundred pound. I'm talking in pounds because I'm British. These measure jump height only. Then we've got systems like contact mats and light beams. They measure flight time and contact time and use a formula G times flight time squared over eight to measure jump height. They range from 10 pound to about a thousand pound and they also give you some other time-based variables like reactive strength index. Uh, JB mentioned an app, smartphone app, this one's called MyJump that will use flight time and accelerometer and the, and the video input and will also give you force velocity profiles. Very cheap uh, application as well. Then we go on to force platforms they give you force derived measures and can range from about a thousand pound up to a fifteen thousand pound but they give you the added information of much more in-depth analysis of forces power velocity asymmetries and movement strategies that i'll talk about uh, in a minute or two this is the the squat jump and what we can see here is a force trace and we start with, with body weight and we can detect the onset of movement here. It's very critical to get a good measure of body weight and a very stable force at the beginning. Otherwise it affects the onset of integration and the calculations of onset or of the movement. So steady body weight is absolutely critical. So we see Mustafa there in a squat position, everything is concentric. He jumps up, pushes hard, he's going for maximal height, and then he lands again. So what we've got here, we can got some characteristic uh, markers on the force trace, which tells us the start of movement, the peak takeoff force, takeoff, landing. And from that, we can get things like movement time, flight time, and the displacement graph um, is uh, calculated from the impulse uh, di displacement uh, methods and we can see that the net change in, in height from the point of takeoff to the maximum displacement gives us our jump height. The counter movement jump again important for a, a stable body weight at the beginning. We start upright, we bend down, stretch short and cycle, explosive off the, the ground, we've got a flight and a landing. Characteristic points, movement time can now be split into eccentric time and concentric time. We've got our flight time, our displacement graph and the net change in displacement gives us our jump height. The drop jump, we land with two feet at the same time. We accept the force, we drive off and we go for maximum height. This is a lot more challenging uh, as you can see from the, the impact 
And the things we get from here are contact time, eccentric time, concentric time, flight time. Again, displacement and jump height. But with the drop jump, we also get other measures like reactive strength index, which is flight time over contact time. That's basically saying how much more time can I spend in the air than I did on the ground generating the impulse to get the height that they achieve. And another one that's quite uh, in vogue at the minute is vertical stiffness, which is a measure of the peak force in the contact phase divided by the maximum displacement in the contact as well. But I'm going to focus more on the counter movement jump because th there's a, a lot of research now on counter movement jump and its different applications and if I'm honest with you sometimes I get a little bit confused by the different terminology so what I'm going to try and do is explain the, the terminology to you and show you how that all relates to jump performance. So we measure displacement from the onset position. Here in a counter movement jump you're upright, uh, in a squat jump you're much lower, but that would be your reference point. We start bending down, we get to the maximum descent, and at the maximum descent you can see that the, the peak force here is very close to the onset of the concentric phase. Some people mistakenly think that the bottom here in the trough is the, the end of eccentric phase, but it's not. If we look at the displacement graph, we can see it's at lowest point is when you're close to your, your, your peak force. We then push up to the point of takeoff, and you can see that this is the displacement of the center of mass. Again, we look at the point, the displacement at the point of takeoff, the maximum displacement, and jump height is the, the difference between the two. If we can just slide that down now, the overlay overlays onto the displacement curve, and we can see that the, the maximum displacement here, the depth of the counter movement, is also when velocity is zero. So we start with zero velocity, at the end of the displacement, at the onset of the concentric phase, velocity is zero as well. We can pick out things like peak eccentric velocity, how quick you are in the, in the counter movement, and the peak concentric velocity. But the, the jump height is the effect of the impulse, the area or the net area under the force time curve. So we're going to look at that in a bit more detail now. So the velocity of takeoff well, cannot, we can also uh, calculate the jump height from that using conservation of energy. It works out as the velocity of takeoff squared divided by two times gravitational acceleration. This part of the graph from the onset of movement to where we re-establish body weight is called eccentric unloading impulse. From that point where we re-establish body weight to the point of the concentric phase is called eccentric deceleration impulse. And because velocity is zero at both points, then that means that these two areas are the same. It also means that the, the concentric phase governs how high we jump. Okay, so here we've got the concentric active impulse, the area above body weight, and then we have a little bit of unloading impulse, and it's the net concentric impulse that gives us the mass times the velocity at takeoff. This is another variable that we, we threw into the, some, some of our software, which we call the positive takeoff impulse, and that's essentially the, the muscular effort in eccentric and concentric phases before any unloading. So let's look at movement strategies. We hear a lot about movement strategies now, uh, particularly in terms of neural fatigue and how people achieve uh, a jump performance. So ju we've just said before, jump height is determined by the net impulse in the concentric phase. But the force at the, end, at the onset of the concentric phase is a consequence of the eccentric phase. And I just want to demonstrate something here. If 
the eccentric phase was slower and longer. So it's longer duration, slower and deeper. What that would effectively give us is a longer eccentric phase and the, a slower rate of force development leading up to the end of the eccentric phase. So the force at the onset of concentric phase, it's often referred to as force at zero velocity as well, is a lot lower. Now bearing in mind that the force at the onset of concentric phase in a squat jump is your body weight, the effect of the counter movement is raising the, the, the tension within your system to a much higher level than body weight. But the effect of a slower and deeper eccentric phase is meaning that the, the onset of your concentric phase, the force is not as high. Now by virtue of being lower and not having as much force at the onset of concentric phase, means that your concentric time will be longer. But that's not to say that the jump height will be any less or it could be the same. If you've got the same jump height there will be a performance deficit by virtue that it takes you longer to achieve the same result. So what we're looking for for some really finely tuned athlete is that you generate more concentric impulse in a shorter duration. So the, the latest application of force plate technology really has been in, in neuromuscular fatigue monitoring. That is a term that I struggle to understand at times, but I'll try and put some sense around it now. Some individuals go for the, the golden bullet variable, like force and onset of concentric phase. For me, I think it's, there's more to it than that. I think it's a process. And we have to create uh, athlete-specific thresholds of when they're fresh. So when they're rested after two days or more, uh, you start taking data and building up that profile and threshold of what fresh looks like. Some people would say that jump height isn't sensitive to neuromuscular fatigue monitoring. Now I would say that's your context. Your jump height is your, jump height is your performance outcome. If you don't use that first, then you're missing part of the story. You've got to look at jump height. And this is the, the workflow that I would go through. If my performance, my jump height, is greater than the upper threshold, I would say that the, the athlete would be fairly fr uh, fresh. If they're lower than the threshold, I'd say they're fatigued. I'm trying to make this as much common sense as I can. But if they're in the middle of this threshold, we would probably need to explore it further. And by looking at it in, in more depth, I'm now going to look at the concentric time and my force at the onset of the concentric phase. So if my concentric time or the force at the onset of the concentric phase is the same or better, I would probably say the athlete has recovered. If the concentric time is longer, or the force at the onset of concentric phase is lower, there could be some performance deficit. Now, because this is one performance, everything is interrelated. I think we lose sight of that at times. So if I've got a longer concentric time, just going back on what I said before, it will be a deeper counter movement, slower. You will also get um, a lower peak eccentric velocity, lower eccentric rate of force development and a deeper counter movement. So what? Okay, that's a question. So what when you're working in an integrated uh, support team, what does this mean? And what in interventions do you do from it? So if an athlete is spending a little bit more time in the concentric phase, maybe not jumping quite as high, it would indicate that they're using more muscular effort than that using the elastic uh, tissue, so it becomes less efficient. It also may point out that one leg isn't functioning as well. So therefore, the interventions could be, and I'm not saying this is for definite, but they could be. If you've got signs of fatigue, you've got to be looking at conversations around recovery. If you've got some asymmetry, 
or one leg is not functioning, then we do some musculoskeletal assessment, look at the asymmetry of left and right forces, which a lot of the force plate systems now give you. This is now an example of a test we do with some of our jumpers at Aspire. It's quite unique. We, uh, we're doing a test called the 1-1. One -one. And young Jabber here, he starts with a counter movement. He jumps up as high as he can. He's going over 50 centimeters there. He lands and he tries to get out of that as quick as he can to do a rebound jump. So everything in this test is about responding to his maximal effort. So we plotted uh, Jabber over time, all season, and we can see our thresholds. This is his average on a Sunday when he's rested, and we do Sunday and Thursday. Our weekends here are Friday, Saturday. So we have thresholds of, uh, on the green line of the upper threshold and the red line is the lower threshold. We're looking to see when he's in the, the, the above the upper threshold and when he's below. Here, we would say he's he, he would be sh sh showing signs of fatigue. For the reactive part, we can use many different variables from coefficient of restitution, which I've got here, which is an indication of the ratio between velocity uh, impact to the velocity out. Um, we could look at other things like um, uh, stiffness, we can look at reactive strength index, various, various measures. But what it does, we've got a little indicator here and what we don't want to be is in the red. We want to, ideally we want to be in the green here where he's jumping as high as he can above, uh, above the upper threshold and he's responding that, to that very well as well. But we don't want to see is in the red here where he's not jumping as high as he can and even if he's not jumping as high if he can't respond to that so we're looking at explosiveness in the counter movement and reactiveness in the the the, the drop jump part of it but and it, this is a real big but these are observations to support decisions not necessarily to make decisions in isolation I think we'll, we can often lose sight that the data we collect is the be-all and end-all, and it's not. We've got to look at these results in the context of the overall holistic athlete profile, the stage that they're in in their training program, what their performance goals are. We need to listen to the athlete's feedback and then telling us if they're tired or not. And coaches and other support staff intelligence on the boys. So it's putting the, the icing on the cake, if you like. The, the quantitative information from the jump testing is supporting the overall picture. Return to play is another uh, area that the physios uh, are very keen to look at. Here we can see a, a force profile of someone who's very heavily right leg dominant, possibly post injury. We can see big deficits uh, bias towards the right leg based on peak force which are these values here the average in the eccentric phase and the average in the concentric phase these are very simple measures of what that graph is showing us but how do we interpret that a lot of people just go 10 percent difference and that'll do them well what we did we looked at thresholds again we looked at the absolute difference between two limbs. We're not looking at dominant, non-dominant. We're just saying what would be a typical difference between two limbs. We found the average absolute difference and standard deviation. And our threshold was absolute difference mean plus a standard deviation. And what we see here uh, for different sports, cricket, rugby, soccer, and some, some elite athletes as well, these were the, the typical thresholds. Beyond those thresholds, I'd be pretty inclined to say there's, there is some asymmetry there that the physios and the S&C coaches and the coaches may want to look into further. But interestingly, in this data, what we can see is that soccer players tended to be a little bit more symmetrical than the other players. Now, there could be some reasons for that. Some sports... Uh, predispose uh, participants to some asymmetrical movements. So we, this is why it's important to look at sport specific thresholds of asymmetry to try and make some intelligence and some de decisions from, from that information. 
This is my final slide. And just to put performance in context, this is a, a grading scheme that we've got for our boys at Aspire. It's derived from almost 30 years of testing jumps, uh, long and triple jump in, in particular, acknowledging that performance is just not about jumping. It's about speed, it's about strength, power, the reactiveness against the ground, and how they put that into a horizontal jump performance. And what we see is, when our boys entered our program at the age of 15, we're looking for jump heights of around 33 centimetres. And interestingly, their drop jump performance from 40 centimetre drop height is 29 centimetres with a reactivity of 1.45. These are just some simple metrics that we extract. We don't go to the full depth of force at onset of concentric phase, etc. We keep it very simple. By the time they leave the academy, if they were world junior potential, we would expect jump height in a counter movement of about 57 centimetres, 56 centimetres in the drop jump. That gap has got smaller. Reactivity index of 3.43 and a contact time of around about 0.2 of a second. If you look a little bit higher, senior athletes, world-class athletes, your Mutaz Barshims, your Jonathan Edwards, these sort of guys would be doing 65 centimetres plus in the counter movement jump and the drop jump the same. Anecdotally, what we see as, as our athletes get older, their drop jump performance, their ability to react matches that of the counter movement jump. The, de the deficit between them uh, decreases. So, and again, the senior athletes would be spending over four times more time in the air than they would do in the contact as well. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into what is a good jump performance, the different applications of jump testing, and uh, that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil, for the excellent talk. And uh, I hope everybody online agrees with me. This is a, a great overview of how to use uh, jump testing appropriately, what kind of data you can look for, how you can use the information not only for uh, training athletes but also for uh, rehabilitation purposes. And then finally, the framework for uh, evaluating uh, jump athletes is definitely something very, very useful to implement. I will now be moving to the podium because I will present the next talk. So I think after we have seen uh, um, some information about sprint testing and uh, jump testing, we now move to how we can integrate information, how we can develop the training program. And I will be using uh, an example in a sport I'm uh, very familiar and passionate about, which is handball. But there is also another reason. Handball is a very successful sport here in Qatar. The Qatar national team was a silver medalist in the 2015 World Championships that were held here. We run a big project here during the World Champs and has been confirming leadership in Asia since then um, and has been uh, performing very well at the last World Championships in uh, Egypt with under coach Valero Rivera. So there is a, there is a connection with Qatar and handball. Um, what I would like to start with is, first of all, it's important when you are developing a training plan or, or a training uh, uh, planification for any sport is to consider how you are going to use the information, the testing, the information about the sport, how, how you're going to put everything together to have a successful plan. So the first thing that is very important to consider is that you need to identify very early what it takes to succeed uh, in a sport. So you need to know the results, the score, the demands, what's important, uh, so you can start thinking about what you need to do uh, for your athletes. You need to define the performance model, so you need to know the physiological demands, the technical demands, tactical aspects, nutritional aspects, anything that can tell you what is important in that particular sport. Then you need to start determining the KPIs, which is what do you need to measure in your athletes or in your team and how that information can drive the program and how that information can be helpful for your program. Then you finally can assess the athlete. So we've seen some examples of assessments before in sprints and jumping, and you can identify the strengths and weaknesses of your athletes. Um, once you have that information, of course, you can start planning and deploying the program of intervention and it's about a detailed training plan, the detailed intervention you're going to do. And finally, you have a phase of review by repeating those assessments and having 
continuous information on the progress of the athletes or the lack of it. Uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, there is a specific book chapter in this new book that is about to come out in the next few weeks, which is the NSCA's Essentials of Sports Science. And there is a dedicated chapter I wrote on key performance indicators in sport, so you can read more about it. But let's go back to the example of handball. So if you use that framework in handball, uh, what do we know about handball in terms of performance determinants? There is a series of things that determine performance, the physiological demands, the technical demands, the tactical demands, etc. But if we focus on the physiological demands, we know that there is a certain level of aerobic capacity that is needed, and aerobic capacity, sprinting ability, repeated sprint ability, jumping and throwing, acceleration and deceleration. And then we know that the training interventions, for example, to improve the aerobic capacity can be high intensity intermittent type of training sessions, small sided games or more general type of activities on the track. And one way we can assess the progress of the athlete or identify at what level the athlete is at is using a test like the 3015 uh, intermittent test developed by Martin Boucher. So this is a way that you can build a uh, framework to help you drive the type of assessments you need to implement in your teams and in your athletes and also the type of interventions that you can uh, write in your program. And what do we know from uh, handball performance demands? Uh, we have quite a lot of information now. So in the chapter that you downloaded, there is this work from uh, Claude Karcher and uh, Martin Boucher. So we know that different positions would cover different distances at different speeds during a handball game. And if you're not familiar with handball, we can probably cluster the positions in a uh, few main ones. So the wings are the ones that play in attack in this position. The backs are the ones that play in the middle. The center back uh, is also considered a back in most of the analysis, is a playmaker of the team. And then the pivot or the line player plays on the line in attack. And the goalkeeper has got uh, specific requirements because of course he's not running around much, uh, but it's important for saving balls and, uh, and trying to keep the score down for your team. So the data we have is that uh, athletes can cover a distance up to uh, 5,000 meters and more at very high level. And the way they run on the field is divided in different types of activities from walking to running to fast sprinting and total sprinting. And we also know that they spend a relative amount of time at very high intensity, moderate to high intensity, depending on the position they play, on their level of fitness, on the characteristics of the match and the technical and tactical disposition of the team. During the World Championships in 2015, we conducted a very large scale study where we analyzed all the games of the World Championships using video technology. And we uh, were able also to identify different patterns of activity within uh, the athletes, not only the total distance, but also, for example, the number of acceleration and decelerations that they were uh, performing in different directions on the field, according to their position of play and the technical and tactical characteristics of the match. Um, a number of papers have been published as a consequence of that. But what we found was that we can really identify the demands of the players, depending not only on the nominal position they have on the field of play, but also on the specific demands they have within a team in terms of technical and tactical assignments that they are given to the coach. So in this graph here, you can see the difference, for example, between a player that is appearing now uh, very often in high level teams, which is a defense specialist. So somebody that only plays in defense and you can see that the area of activity is concentrated in the defensive part, first half and second half. The attack specialist, so somebody that comes in only in attack, so it's all, always switching with the defense specialist. And you can see that the zone of attack is, of course, the, the one that is covering the most and the different intensity depends on the color you see on this graph. And a player that has attacking and defensive demands that is playing in both positions, you can see that the distance covered is a lot more, the intensity that he covers is a lot higher, and there is, of course, a larger physiological demand on this kind of player. So what we have um, uh, published and suggested in this number of papers is that there is a big difference between uh, the demands of different players you shouldn't assume that they are the same just because they play a nominal position, but you should find out more what they actually do. And in this particular case, we, uh, we were probably in the first paper that kind of highlighted the role of the defense specialist and specifying the kind of activities they do. And even if the total distance is not very high, the demands are really constrained to a lot of small accelerations uh, in a very short period, in a, in a very short space. So the training prescription for this kind of player by knowing this data 
can be of course different to the demands of other players. What else do we know? This is in your chapter. We know, for example, that the demands depend a lot not only on the position the players are in, but also on the tactical position they have to play in a team. If they defend 3-2-1 uh, or if they defend 5-1 or if they defend 6-0 is a completely different thing. But what we know is that they might spend a large amount of time near the maximal heart rate, especially if they are playing a lot on court in defense and attack position, and their level of blood lactates can be very high, even reaching levels uh, over 12 to 14 millimoles. This is, of course, depending on, on their individual activity on court, and there is a large variability depending on the position they play, in this case the center back at 3.1 millimoles per liter of blood lactate measured, whether the left back at 12.6. So again, the key is to make the measurements that are relevant to identify what the demands of your players are and then use that information to implement the appropriate training activities. Uh, handball is, is really a, a track and field played uh, in a team scenario because we have three main activities that are performed. We have sprinting, jumping and throwing. And we know, for example, from the literature that uh, the sprints and accelerations are performed with distances that are ranging from 2 to 3 meters up to 18 meters. Uh, the length of the handball court is 40. There are more than 800 activity changes in one match and there is about 120 seconds average recovery times in between. So it's an intermittent game, there's a lot of things happening uh, and so if you are developing a sprinting program you need to know that this is what's happening. If you want to develop their jumping abilities, you should know that 70% of the shots are jump shots in handball. Ground reaction force at the moment of contact on the ground with these players is about three times their body mass and even more. And usually they take off with about less than 300 milliseconds uh, ground contact. So if you are designing a strength training program, this is key information that you need. Um, throwing speed is very high. In the last World Championships, you might, you might have seen a, uh, seen a few players. Uh, reaching this speed, 120 kilometers per hour drop throwing speed. Uh, wings and pivot are also performing a variety of spin shots that require fast speed uh, of rotation of the shoulder. And you should look at the position of the shoulder and the body position when they are performing those shots. And finally, goalkeepers, they have about a 30% save rate at the elite level. And we have shown that uh, uh, if you want to win at the, at the elite level, you need high save rates, of course. And uh, now, because of the new rules that have been implemented with the attacking goalkeeper position, they have to perform a lot more movement because most of the times they have to sprint out of their goal to change with the attacking player and then sprint back in when the attacking player comes out. So I think their demands have changed a little bit and so you should take that into account when designing the training program. So what do you do with this information? From knowledge, you have to move to planning. And so this is a useful framework that was in your chapter where you have the position of the player, the strength uh, uh, demands of this kind of player, the speed demands of this kind of player, the metabolic function or the metabolic demands of this kind of player, and also from the injury studies we know what, the ki what kind of injury prevention plans you can put in place. And so when you, when you know this, you have a good framework to work on, you know how to assess your players, you are finally moving to a planning activity where you can start implementing a variety of training sessions. And these are examples of how you can program the training sessions details with particular reference to developing uh, speed endurance or the, the endurance specific capacity of players uh, in, in handball. So these are examples of typical sessions where you can have short intervals or repeated sprint training or sprint interval training or using small sided games. This is the type of intensity you can reach. This is the between effort recovery you can have, the expected time near VO2 max, the oxygen energy delivery system that you target with these different activities, the expected blood lactate and the expected neuromuscular load. And these are examples of some of the sessions where you have players performing technical activities or repeated sprints. And in this particular graph, it, you can see that if you plan your small sided games appropriately, you can reach um, uh, metabolic demands that are very similar to uh, sprint intervals, but also by measuring very simple things like the time spent over 90%, for example, of heart rate max, or the time spent over 90% of your VO2, if you have the ability to measure it, you can cluster and classify the different drills and start to be better at planning sessions, putting the right drills into the right place. And again, if you have the, now the 
access to um, inertial measurement units that can give you information about the distance covered by the players and the number of accelerations and decelerations, you can start to cluster and characterize training sessions that are handball specific, also having clear information about not only the metabolic demands, but also the work output that the athletes perform. Strength training is of course very important in handball. As we've seen before, there is a variety of demands. This is an example of a, a typical strength and conditioning program, a pre-season for uh, an elite team of the Italian league quite a few years ago. And with a systematic approach where you individualize the training program for your athletes, in a very short period of time in pre-season, it's, it's possible to in improve the counter movement jump by 9%. For example, this is a first league team that went into European Cups in Italy. And also with a, a systematic training, it's possible to improve um, force and power abilities of the upper body. Like in this case, a player that started a systematic strength training program in 1999, a few years later, there's a big improvement in power output as measured in the bench press uh, exercise with different loads. And we know very well that in handball, there is a, a correlation between the power output you produce it during a bench press and throwing speed. So it's quite an important KPI that you can implement in your handball teams. And we have seen that with systematic approaches, it's possible to shift the force velocity and the power velocity curve, um, force velocity to the right and the power velocity um, uh, relationship uh, up. So you improve power output and the ability to produce force. So the key is to have a plan and to have KPIs and assessments in place to identify what's happening in your athlete and modify your training program. So how can sports science make a difference? As we've seen before, collecting, analyzing, sharing training and competition data is your evidence that you try to gather. The day-to-day -day interaction and the development of the coach library allows you to support in situ and enhance the coaching uh, activities. So if you measure things that are happening on the field of play, in the gym, or periodically in your athletes, you can interact with the coaching staff, you analyze what the coaches do, and you can provide useful information to modify drills or activities or introduce new activities to improve the players. There are special projects uh, that you can do with data, like what we've seen before in the talk from uh, Dr. Phil Graham Smith. You can assess, for example, fatigue in your players after a game. So you can start answering questions using uh, testing and information that can uh, influence your decision making for various interventions on the players. And finally, debrief. If you continuously reassess the training and the competition support process, you have arguments to debrief and improve the process all the time. Otherwise, it's always about opinions and opinions without data are not very powerful means of improving athletes' performance. So you can use a, a very simple framework of assess, plan and review. So assess is what we've seen before. You can engage and collect evidence, collate and score. You can conduct integrating analysis. You can define your sports coaching model and understand it and define the measures you're going to use, set targets, identify and prioritize actions and have clear outputs, which is a coaching action plan and improve the coaching knowledge base. So you modify continuously what you're doing to make it better. And finally, you can improve athletes by defining the athlete profile, define the target profile as we've seen before define the coaching and training activities, schedule the activities appropriately, and finally use the data for review. And this can only happen when you record the measures, you analyze the measures and provide feedback, and you have the final output of metrics to track coaching and performance. So use a framework, put it in place, use the right testing, use the right data, and you can uh, definitely use the information to drive the training program. So in summary, I think if you use a scientific approach to define the performance model, as we've seen in the example of handball, you have the advantage of knowing what needs to happen for your players. Uh, you can develop a data-driven approach to gather intelligence, so you can test, assess, modify, and see how things are going. You can assess the athlete, the team, and track their progress, so you can individualize the training interventions and also uh, make sure that the athletes are progressing in the right way. And you can assess the content of training sessions to identify how to modify drills. But the key is to develop reporting tools that are able to inform practice. And uh, I'm very happy to say that the next speaker will be talking about this particular topic. So you will be able to see examples of how reporting tools are used from data gathering to inform practice. And thank you for your attention. Um, I will introduce directly the next speaker.
the next speaker is uh, Andre Fornesiero. He's the senior physiologist in the football performance science department in Aspire. Again, there is a connection here with Qatar. So Qatar is uh, uh, the current Asian football champion. Um, and uh, you will have the chance now to hear about how Aspire Academy and, and the QSL work with the monitoring training, with tracking technology, and how the reporting influences and informs training. Andre, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, everyone. First of all, thanks, Mark, for these kind uh, words. Uh, for me, it's a, uh, an honor to, to be here and to share some thoughts about this relevant topic on behalf of Aspire Academy and Football Insights Department. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, uh, we will cover basically these three topics, right? Data management and its complexity uh, here uh, in this country. Uh, second, some data uh, evaluation based on all data collected. And third, some reporting example on how can we use data to apply and to create some impact. Okay, let's see my arrow here. Okay, so regarding this, this first topic, we know that the amount of data collected uh, uh, currently is really massive. So here, for instance, in our uh, uh, academy, we are collecting data from under 13 teams up to the under 18 teams, also using different devices. But this is just, just a small part of the puzzle because we are also collecting data from the national teams from under 16 until the first team. And we are also collecting data here from all the clubs uh, in our league using also different devices. So all this data is located in, in, in one same platform, which, we, which allows us to visualize this data, use different devices like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, tools like Power BI, R, SAP, which we can provide a long-term development of, of our players from youth to senior, right? So which is a unique environment um, around the world. Okay, regarding our second uh, topic here, how to evaluate our performance data based on all data uh, uh, that is currently uh, get right here. We can just basically uh, share some uh, basic steps here to be followed when we speak about collecting data. So from collecting data until using this data itself. So we can collect data from uh, from the status of uh, our players regarding athletes of reporting measurements or neuromuscular and functional uh, 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 variables as Phil just covered really well before. We have also this moment to staff Feedback is the moment that we, we report the key aspects and we support the decision-making process. So this is a really important moment, the moment that we, uh, we need to speak their language, the moment that we provide the, the right information that should be used in a regular basis. Uh, we also have this moment of the in-session analysis, the moment that we have this real-time monitoring and we have this target analysis. So this is the moment that we, we can compare what was planned before and what is currently doing uh, in the session and then we can see what can be done in order to achieve the target done before set before sorry and also we have this post session analysis moment which is the moment that we can compare the actual data with some benchmarks we show uh, i will share uh, in in few slides later and also we can define some key aspects that should should be addressed in the staff feedback meeting so this is just a framework as marco really showed really well a lot of frameworks also this is just a framework on how to use from collecting data until using this data itself. And in, in, in regards to this uh, analysis uh, itself, we, there are two main aspects that should be emphasized. So instead of using absolute speed zones, we are proposing using relative speed zones based on performance assess uh, assessment uh, 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 variables like maximum aerobic speed, maximum sprint speed, and, uh, and anaerobic uh, speed reserve. So, in regards to maximum sprint speed, it's important to emphasize that which is a really important component of our long-term development here uh, in the academy. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting paper published by some colleagues here, which, is, which allows us using the GPS data uh, to track this information because it aligns with the LAVEC system, which is the goal standard system to analyze this metric. Okay, so going in depth on the benchmark definition, we can have here two kinds of benchmarks. So basically, we can compare the load of the player with match data, just a matter of having the ratio of the, the, um, the actual load with the match load of the player, and we can have this percentage, and we can also classify here. We, we start 
uh, uh, speaking about delivering a message in order to uh, instead of only providing the number the value we are providing the message here which is low load moderate load or high load we can also compare use the match data with uh, the weak comparison as we can compare the accumulated load and we can classify how many times we cover the match during the week and to classify and to use the colors to to show like low load moderate load and high load but we know that sometimes it, it's a bit complicated using match data as reference because we can we cannot have data maybe for all players or for all metrics and in order to solve this issue we propose using historical data so in this case we are delivering a different message the message is typical load higher lower load or much higher or much lower load based on historical data for that specific player for that specific data type which is really specific but the message here is different so going in depth on this example we can see here the percentiles that we are using so basically we rank all the data for that player from the highest low uh, load to the to the the lowest load using the percentiles we can set the boundaries here percentile 2.5 15 85 and 97.5 and we can arrive in these five groups here is much lower lower typical higher and much higher so just a, as an example we have here 16 observations for the same player okay and if we rank them and use the percentiles we can set these boundaries here so just an example if we target for this player a much higher training session this player should cover more than 7k to, to arrive in this group and this, this uh, interpretation uh, we can also classify all the historical data on all those groups and we can see all the sessions in which group they stand so for instance a much lower training session a lower training session typical training session a higher training session and a much higher training session so this is just an example i know that sometimes it could be a bit complicated from the coach point of view to understand all these calculations these percentiles and this, these uh, uh, statistics behind of that but we don't need to to explain that so if if if, if they want no problem but they need only to understand the message as i showed before we are delivering here a message so they need to understand in which group this player uh, uh, stands in that session so for instance this player run more than 7k it means like a much higher 20 session which is uh, this is the message that we are focused uh, on delivering okay regarding the third topic here some example on how we are reporting data here in the academy we can see here some core concepts that we use it here in order to build the visuals uh, needed so uh, we know that using all the softwares like power bi like r like sap we we can build a lot of a uh, lot and thousands and thousands of graphs but here instead of building thousands of graphs and repeating the same information and the same data in different uh, uh, graphs we propose using uh, analyzing first the questions so how are the uh, what are the main uh, questions that we are receiving frequently from the staff from coaches SNCs, physios so we started from the questions and we finished in the visual so this framework is just to emphasize and to organize our, our, our thoughts in order to see how are uh, what are the visuals that should be created and this framework starts from questions and finishes visuals so it's really easy for everyone or all members of our staff to go to this framework based on the questions that they started okay in the beginning of this framework they arrive in a visual that answer the questions that they have i will show this framework later on and we can also and this is another core concept used here in the academy is, is thinking about the story so we are not only providing data here as i mentioned before the amount of data collected regularly is is, is massive we have thousands and thousands of, uh, of data of uh, files whatever we need to to use this data into information because with, once we have the information we are creating knowledge so just an example as i mentioned before uh, if the uh, that player that I'm, i showed the uh, uh, in our uh, in our uh, uh, picture if that player run 8k for instance this is a data what does it mean for him so it means like a much higher training session okay but what should we do now so maybe we should manage his load in the following session because what we planned the asset was not a much higher session we planned a typical session for him okay so this is a kind of using data and telling the story based on data where we have many data much data here but we need to use it this into information to create some knowledge sorry and also the third part is uh, this part of uh, interaction so 
all dashboards here that we built are really uh, interactive. So we can play around many periods in, in different periods, day, weeks, month, whatever. We can set different drills, elements of the session, first set, second set, total session uh, of the of our uh, exercise uh, that we did. Uh, we can also select different players, positions, and also different metrics. So everything here is open, uh, nothing is fixed, so everyone can go to this dashboard to understand what we've done, uh, what, what can be done, and to arrive in the message that, that they need. Okay, so this is our framework that we built. So we can start here from session, day, uh, some drill analysis, longitudinal, and match. Okay, regarding the session itself, uh, we can start here from the session day overview. This is to answer the question of the most frequent question that we are receiving, like, how was the session? Okay, so if you want to see like an overview of the session, we go here for the visual number one. Okay, so if you want to see like some target analysis, as I mentioned before, we have this moment to, to analyze the target uh, during the match. Okay, so we go here for the live track analysis. We start from the in-session analysis, but if we have this in-session analysis, we don't need any visual. But we, if we don't have, we go to the post-session analysis and we arrive in the visual to, to, to answer that question. But we can delve in uh, in, in the session itself, analyze some drills. So, if I want to see the impact per drill in the players in the same session, we arrive in this, in this visual. If we, if we want to see, like, historically, how was the most demanding drill? Okay, you go to visual number four, you can arrive. Also, you can uh, uh, find the answer to this question. And in, in a bigger picture, we can analyze weeks. So, we can analyze the week within the week, how the week progressed, uh, how the load uh, was built during the week. We can see local, uh, also the week overview. We can compare week, weeks by weeks with the same concept of historical data. And we can also see the week by week progression, how the week, uh, how uh, each week compared to the, follow to, to the last one. Yeah, this is a, as a longer term picture. And also in the match, we can also use the same for the session on the overview. So just to provide some examples on how we are using in this pathway, the uh, the graphs and reports. So here we have the session overview report based using the match as the as the benchmark. So as you can see here, we have the actual load for each player, and the black dots are the values from the match, and the colors are based on this classification that I mentioned before. So we can see here easily that the, the major of the players arrived in the low load session, but we have here three players for this specific metric that arrived in a, in a higher session that should be uh, discussed and contextualize this data to understand why uh, this happened. Uh, so this is um, uh, really straightforward to understand using a proper benchmark, using colors to report, and we are also delivering a message. So this player run close to this, to his uh, match demand. So the coach will, will understand that easily in a few seconds also using the color, they can understand all the concepts behind this, this visual. We can also analyze the session as a historical data session, like for instance, here we have uh, our historical data with this classification, as I mentioned before. So we can see here the players that had much low, um, uh, 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 much lower and lower training session, typical training sessions, and higher training sessions. So for each player here, we have the black lines, which are the boundaries that I mentioned before in the bell-shaped curve. So this is an uh, uh, an important uh, moment also to share this data because it's also easy to understand. So here we can see like the majority of the player arrived in a typical session. But we have here two players that arrived in a much higher session for this specific metric. So it's easy, it's very forward the message that we are trying to highlight use this kind of representation. And we can also go to, the, to this other uh, pathway for the weekly analysis. So this is a weak prioritization, it's a really interesting one. We have here the, the, the daily load of the, of the week, okay, comparing to the match using the same uh, benchmark showed before, and we can also see here the weekly prioritization based on the accumulated load throughout the week. So as the week progressed, we can see how the load was built during the week compared to the match to, to uh, arrive in the message how, uh, how many matches we covered during the week. So another interpretation, again using colors, but the same benchmark to analyze the week uh, now instead of once in a, uh, only uh, analyzing the uh, daily session in isolated. And in here we can see another uh, pathway to arrive at this visual. This is the weekly overview. It's the same concept used in the day type, historical data, 
but this is a weak uh, comparison. We are comparing here uh, week by week in, uh, in the same percentiles, in the same uh, 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 concept before. So we can see what are the players that arrived in a typical week, in a, low, uh, in a higher week, and in a much higher week. So we can see here for this specific metric in the same concept as I showed before. So this is really useful uh, to analyze when we finish a week here in the academy, but also during the week we can see if we target some, if we target some, some, uh, if we, if we decided some targets based on this classification, you can see how far they are from that target as the week progresses. Uh, this this red flag system could also be used for this training status evaluation, as I mentioned before. There is a moment that we are collecting information from atlas of reported measurements, and based on this really uh, interesting paper. We can see here uh, the players that had higher uh, answers and much higher answers based on their own historical data. Then we can provide the same information to the staff right before the session uh, uh, to arrive in the message, like how are the players before the sessions, how they are based on their own feeling. Just to finish, as a take-home message, we are providing here not only high-quality data, but also its interpretation, which means telling the story. In order to arrive in that message, we should have a robust data management, appropriate benchmarks, and powerful visualization. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Again, Mark and um, uh, all involved here in this forum, and all the members involved in all these discussions to arrive in such a uh, level of visualization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. It's a fascinating uh, talk. I think uh, it's probably a unique opportunity for everybody that is online now to have access to understanding a bit more about the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to to support the football players in Qatar. So it should be no surprise that uh, Qatar was very successful at the Asian Championships. Uh, the work that the team led by Professor Walter Di Salvo, um, that the team is doing uh, led by Professor Walter Di Salvo in Aspire Academy uh, is unique. And uh, I would like to highlight the fact that thanks to the databases that are kept in Aspire Academy, Academy, not only in the football department, but also in athletics and the collaboration with Aspita. In the last two months, there have been three papers in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which are uniquely analyzing three or four years of career of a group of youth athletes that are training full time every day. And it's a very unique data set around the world that is helping us understand how injuries occur and how injuries are related to growth and maturation. So if you have not seen those papers, make sure you do look for them because it's, uh, it's really unique. And we think that with this approach, we will understand even more about how to develop athletes and we will share, of course, the information with a wider community. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Scott Cocking. So uh, as the session progressed today, you have seen that we started first from assessment, understanding a little bit more of how we can make measurements to, to understand what athletes should and shouldn't be doing. We then moved on integrating the information to uh, understand the sport and develop a training plan. And finally, we have seen a great example of how data can be used to inform training practice and understand how athletes are developing using a, a, a complex framework of data. But this talk is, is unique because it's a way to show how using science that comes from the clinical world, you can develop a method that can be used uh, not only for rehabilitation purposes or for clinical applications, but also in the real world of uh, high performance athletes. So Dr. Scott Cocking completed his PhD at Liverpool John Moores University, but was a full-time PhD researcher here in Aspita before he moved to his current position of physiology uh, physiologist for uh, Aspire Academy. And this evening he will be talking about ischemic preconditioning as a training method. Thank you for the introduction, Marco. Um, and thank you for everyone still joining. Uh, it's been a great range of different talks tonight, focusing on a range of different sports, um, definitely highlighting some high quality work around training, monitoring, testing interventions going on over at this part of the world, certainly. So yeah, as Marco alluded to, just to finish, probably something slightly different compared to what we've had so far. Um, so this talk will predominantly focus on kind of an intervention, IPC, and hopefully it will just open the doors to how it can be used in different contexts um, for different levels of, of participating athletes. So just as a, a starting point, um, as IPC can be defined as basically repeated intermittent bouts 
of occlusion. So arterial blood flow restriction. Uh, full recovery between bouts, usually five minutes each. And the idea of the intermittent clamping and the intermittent ischemia is to induce protection against a sustained ischemic bout. However, over recent years, IPC has actually been used as a performance enhancer or a potential performance enhancer. So most of the literature to date when looking at sports performance has actually looked at the effects of IPC acutely when it's been applied before, in and around a warm-up, with the sole aim of acutely enhancing performance. However, as my talk in the title suggests, I'm actually going to discuss it as a training method because this is kind of the point of this forum tonight. So training can be defined as the use of a repetitive stimulus that develops targeted physiological attributes. And to date, I think the literature when using repeated bouts of IPC over a duration of time has really focused on three key areas. Firstly, you've got some literature looking at maybe four to eight weeks of using IPC before an actual training session say high intensity training. Secondly, you've got maybe eight weeks of repeated IPC, just IPC and no exercise. And thirdly, you've got literature that has assessed five to seven days of using IPC on a daily basis, again with no exercise, and the, the outcomes that this can potentially have on a physical basis. But first, before we actually get into these studies, I think it's important to highlight some of the, uh, some of the contextual similarities between both ischemic preconditioning and high intensity exercise training. So this paper, a great paper done uh, by Dick Tyson's group in Holland, they basically showed some evidence that both ischemic preconditioning and interval training induce similar physiological responses and both can actually cause remote conditioning. And it was suggested that the similar patterns of muscle deoxygenation responses to both IPC and HIT is a key primary mechanism behind why both actually do exert remote conditioning responses um, to tissue infarct and damage. Some other crossover potential mechanisms that are resultant from both high intensity interval training and IPC are reserved to be greater upregulation of the nitric oxide pathway, which has implications for vascular function, and more rapid depletion of ATP, which actually has implications for the muscle itself um, with certain kind of functions such as better maintenance and cell resting potential and prevention of cellular death during injury or insult. So I think the first question to ask is, can we actually enhance the adaptive response to an exercise training session when ischemic preconditioning is applied before it? And as I said, I'll discuss two specific papers that have looked at this to date, um, using a four to eight week period where they've assessed IPC either two or three times weekly before high intensity interval training. So the first study, assess the impact of IPC over eight weeks on running performance. And in highly trained middle distance runners with a VO2 max of around 64, 65 mils per kilo per minute, the main finding was the study um, showed that IPC treatment before three high intensity sessions per week did not improve maximal oxygen consumption, nor one kilometer time trial performance more effectively than just doing HIIT training alone. A later study published 2020 actually showed some conflicting evidence. And they, they actually showed that in endurance athletes, slightly lesser trained this time with a VO2 max of around 57, 58 mils per kilo per minute. Uh, when IPC and sprint interval training in the form of wing gates were performed over eight sessions over a period of four weeks, the IPC plus sprint interval training condition led to greater improvements in mean power output around 5% and completion time of the time trial, around 2% improvement in performance, um, as well as increased fatigue resistance during a Wingate test versus just doing Wingate training alone. Just as the other study suggested, there was no change in maximal oxygen consumption or there was no change in Wingate test power uh, between groups. What was interesting, however, they used some NIRS data collection and they did suggest the current study presents some evidence to suggest that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction in the IPC plus sprint interval training condition. So the, the literature in this area is, is pretty limited to date, but you know I think we need to start asking some questions immediately. So this may follow some literature trends where the better or well-trained group did not receive a benefit from ischemic preconditioning plus HIIT training. The actual exercise intensity of the HIIT training session may, may actually influence um, 
how IPC has an effect. So the, the study in the runners over eight weeks used a very aerobic dominant hit session where it was only 10 minutes of tempo work and three minutes of kind of 1K race pace. Uh, whereas the study that did show benefits of IPC plus training used the sprint interval training method. So very, very intense exercise. So this could be a factor. Also, importantly, the performance task. The study that showed no difference used a very anaerobic predominant under three minutes of total work task. Whereas the study that found a benefit of IPC plus training, uh, the total work duration for that performance task was eight to nine minutes, which sits within that kind of VO2 max aerobic domain. Whilst there was no improvements in VO2 max, this paper did suggest there was evidence that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction in the IPC plus training group. So definitely something to consider there and some further work needs doing. But what happens when ischemic preconditioning is performed without exercise, say over eight weeks, three times a week? What can we expect on the body? So this study, great study performed, showed that compared to a control condition, so if you do nothing and you just do IPC three times weekly for a period of eight weeks, you'll see greater improvements in arterial function measured through flow mediated dilation, following ischemic preconditioning. However, repeated ischemic preconditioning when there's not training involved did not change microcirculatory function or fitness, maybe not too surprising. But when we think of the injured athlete who may not actually have a capacity to exercise or train, could this be something worth investigating? And we know that there are a range of physiological contributors to, to performance, including the cardiovascular system, skeletal muscle system, and even the central nervous system. And previous work has demonstrated that repeated increases in vascular shear stress represent an important stimulus for vascular adaptations in both function and structure. And this is because vascular adaptations are mediated by shear stress dependent mechanisms. Now this was a study done in 2010 and all they looked at was if you do exercise with a shear stress response on the vasculature versus a non shear stress response exercise task as a control, what are the effects on the vasculature? And they showed, you can see this clearly, that over a period of eight weeks, you start to get real significant improvements in flow mediated dilation, which is a function measure, uh, from week two to week six. However, looking at this data, it appears that by week eight, flow mediated dilation returns to the baseline, which may not make much sense. But when we actually take a look at the brachial dilatory response to ischemic exercise, which is a measure of structure and uh, structural remodeling, we can see that there is a significant difference over time. So both together, this study therefore highlights the time dependent changes in both arterial function and remodeling uh, are both shear stress dependent, which is really, really good work. So again, to re-emphasize, for the injured athlete who may not have the capacity to train, given the fact that there is evidence that both IPC and HIIT training induce similar mechanisms and that IPC could potentially be used as an exercise mimetech, um, could we potentially use this for the injured athlete to give some physiological benefit? And based on the work so far, it certainly appears that for the vascular system, this may be a good, easy win. Finally, what happens when we apply five to seven days of IPC every single day with no training stimulus? And before we go into it, we need to ask ourselves what population or athlete might be interested in doing this. And we know that the tapering athlete has a significant reduction in training load. This is a time for recovery and adaptation with a pure focus on resting for race day. So could this be something of interest? And this study, I'm going to start with the most interesting study that I've found to date in untrained population, so 38 mils per kilo per minute VO2 max. They assessed the effects of seven days of IPC on both aerobic and anaerobic performance. What they showed was quite remarkable. 9.5% increases in VO2 max after just 48 hours of ischemic preconditioning treatment, followed by a 12.8% increase in VO2 max after seven days. Maximal aerobic power also correlated 18.5% after 48 hours of IPC and 16.1% improvement after seven days, not to mention the 8.7% increase in Wingate performance. You can see the red highlighted circles on the right. It was an independent groups design and it actually appears that the IPC baseline for whatever does seem a little bit lower than the sham condition. So this may have artificially inflated the relative change between the groups, may have been missed. However, let's say that this is still the case. 
The changes in aerobic performance are truly remarkable in this population. And a little bit tongue in cheek, but if this is correct, it's likely that IPC is probably the best thing since sliced bread. So, you know, it, it does need some future research and maybe a, a kind of repeat model study to see whether the effects can be maintained. But this is certainly something to look at. Secondly, really interesting study at altitude. What happens when we apply IPC for five days when we do a 12 kilometer time trial at very high altitude, over 4,000 meters at peak? Well, in moderately trained adults, 42 years of age on average, five days of IPC significantly improved 12 kilometer time trial running, whilst better maintaining oxygen saturation and attenuating the normal hypoxic increases of pulmonary arterial pressures, which are key contributors to why we cannot perform as well at altitude compared to sea level. And from a previous slide, one of the mechanistic insights collected from NIRS data in the performance task where IPC plus HIIT training uh, resulted in a beneficial uh, outcome, the authors uh, highlight that some evidence again suggested that there was increased muscle perfusion and peripheral oxygen extraction and this may be a key contributing mechanism to why IPC may be a good target in a repeated manner if you are going to altitude. Finally, seven days of ischemic preconditioning on cycling efficiency um, they used healthy individuals, 45 mils per kilo per minute. After seven days, there was no change in VO2 max. However, there was increases in aerobic test performance with a 9% increase in ramp test performance, correlating to around 5% increase in maximal aerobic power or watt max. Whilst there was no change in gross efficiency, you can see from the figure on the bottom left, there was a 3.1% significant improvement in delta cyclone efficiency. This led the authors to conclude that these changes occur in a short time frame, just seven days, and thus could potentially be utilised by athletes during preparation for competition. Whilst the magnitude of improvement may appear small, it could markedly influence performance in prolonged cycling. These authors also go on to state in the discussion that repeated bouts of IPC can actually impact the muscle. So not only can we impact the vasculature, in a repeated IPC model, we can also impact skeletal muscle function. So as you can see, hopefully I've built a picture where we're starting to really build some bases of at least maintaining basic physiological function across a range of different athletes in different contexts. It is worth noting that all of this daily IPC work to date has been used in less or recreationally trained individuals. So more work is needed on more athletic populations to really test whether this is a useful intervention over just the normal taper protocols that an athlete might undertake. So a summary slide. When IPC is used before training, there are a range of uh, moderating factors. These could be actual training status, the hit stimulus involved. Is it an aerobic or an anaerobic predominant hit stimulus? And obviously, what is the performance task? Is it an anaerobically predominant performance task or is it really aerobically taxing? These are all factors that probably need further investigation. For the injured athlete, we've presented evidence stating that IPC is a valid exercise mimetic and certain mechanisms cross over really well with HIIT training. And we know certainly from a vascular function and structure perspective, just doing nothing but repeated bouts of IPC up to eight weeks, we know we can elicit um, significant changes. So this for the injured athlete may, may be an easy win. Finally, potentially for the tapering athlete when IPC is used on a daily basis, uh, we know that IPC can also impact the muscle as well as the vasculature. Uh, however, more work is needed in better trained populations. So I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you for your time. And I really hope that you've enjoyed this, uh, this collection of talks. And I'll pass back over to Professor Marco. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for, uh, for the great talk again. Uh, I think we've seen... Uh, how evidence from uh, different uh, studies can be then interpreted and applied in the field. But I think the, the final message there is always that if you read something that looks good, you need to go and test it with your athletes first to make sure that you're doing no harm and also to uh, be able to develop probably individualized protocols to make sure that that intervention is actually working. So I will try to summarize what we've gone through uh, this evening. Uh, the topic was uh, training methods and assessment. And I think what you've seen is, uh, and hopefully what you've learned, is that uh, there is definitely assessment tools that you can use that can be very complicated or very, very simple, and they can inform the status of your athlete or, or establish benchmarks for your athlete to achieve. 
having it in integrated framework, as you've seen, can help you drive how you plan your training program, how you provide the details of the training activities. Having data that are meaningful and are reported appropriately and can be visualized in a very simple manner can help driving the conversations and the discussion about the content of training and how a particular athlete is evolving. And also having information from scientific papers um, can help you develop new uh, ways of training athletes, but at the end you need to train to assess what's happening with your particular athletes and modify uh, whatever intervention to make sure that he's doing the right things. So I would like to take the opportunity to uh, first thank the speakers uh, for the excellent talks and the content that has been delivered this evening. I think everybody online would agree with me that was uh, uh, an excellent, uh, excellent material as well as the material you received uh, from the book. Uh, I would like also to thank Dr. Uh, Professor Nebosa Popovic for the idea of uh, editing the book and uh, making it available to a wider audience through the forums. Uh, don't forget that five of you that uh, have, be, have registered for the event will receive uh, a copy of the books at home. Um, finally, uh, Ivan Stankovic for coordinating the event and making sure we are here on time, able to, to deliver the content. Uh, Everybody here from the IT support team for putting together the fantastic studio that we're in, making sure the information can be delivered to more than 800 attendees online and everyone else that will decide to see it on our YouTube channel later on. So don't forget, if you missed it, it will be there. And finally, uh, Aspitar for uh, leading this uh, idea and uh, putting it in place. Aspire Academy for the support of the speakers this evening and uh, continuous collaboration and Aspire Zone Foundation for making sure we have the chance to talk and disseminate all the information that we have, not only here, but worldwide to everybody that wants to listen to us. Uh, the final thank you is for all of you that have had the patience to stay online and listen to us and uh, log in and register. Uh, if you want to know more about our activities, there is always our website and our social media channels. But I can anticipate that the next forum, so forum number four, will be on hamstring injuries. So make sure you follow our channels, make sure you register because it will be a very exciting evening. Thank you very much and good night to everyone.